Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Wednesday, January 20th, we are studying Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Jesus calls even a tax collector, Levi, to be one of his disciples. But the scandal of the gospel stands out all the more clearly as Jesus then eats with Levi and other tax collectors and sinners. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Zelwyn Heidi. Pastor Heidi serves at St. Peter Lutheran Church in Hanover, North Dakota, and Zion Lutheran Church in New Salem, North Dakota. He's also one of the hosts of the podcast, A Word Fitly Spoken. Pastor Heidi, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Glad to be back. As we get started this morning, let's talk a little context. Where have we been in Mark's gospel? What do we need to know about the gospel as a whole? That will help us into the text for today. Well, up to this point, there hasn't been a whole lot. We're still very early in the gospel itself. Um, But Jesus has been doing quite a few miracles after he has come back from the wilderness. And and this is kind of after after those miracles. And so Jesus is going to be going out again into a kind of wilderness for a little bit. But then he's still going to do um, be proclaiming the gospel as he goes forward. So. Yeah, I mean, we we really have come to the end of the miracles in chapter two and kind of at the end of chapter one, and we're starting the beginning of of a new section. And I suppose one of the newer things that we've encountered is that Jesus is beginning to face some opposition. The whole first chapter of Mark, the opposition that he faced was demonic. He faced it, but he had no trouble with that. He, you've seen him heal sicknesses. Again, he's had no trouble with that. Now the opposition is starting to, I don't know, take human form, maybe isn't the right way of putting it, but he's <laughs> he's seeing some opposition from people now. His fame has gone out, but at the end of the last text, he's had some of the scribes start to question him, and that conflict is going to start to grow as Mark continues, really through the end of this chapter and into the beginning of chapter three. And of course, it, it's going to continue all the way through the gospel. So, I mean, again, you know, as you said, we're only in chapter two, but it is amazing how much Mark packs in here at the beginning and how he just, I mean, he hits the ground running with his account of Jesus and he, he really never lets up the pace. Yeah. And, and, and we're going to see that too with the, the account itself, talking about the calling of, of Levi, who we also know as Matthew. Uh, Mark says it very quickly. He just kind of gives us the, the details that we need, and then he moves on to the next account. So, yeah, it is. It's a very dense, very uh, condensed uh, account of everything, but there's a lot to unpack here. So, let's take a look at our text for today. We are in Mark chapter two, beginning at verse thirteen. Mark writes, "He, Jesus, went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them." And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. That is our text for today, Mark 2, verses 13 through 17. Pastor Heidi, the text starts with some of Jesus' movement. It says he goes out again beside the sea. This crowd still keeps coming to him, and he keeps teaching them. Take us into that first verse. Sure. He's he's leaving, of course, from Capernaum, <clears throat> heading back out to the Sea of Galilee. He's up here in the north. And you see this kind of movement from time to time, especially immediately after some miracle which he has done. So he's just got done healing the paralytic, and the people are glorifying him, glorifying God, saying, we never saw anything like this. And then, like, you know, earlier on in chapter 1, 
we, where we hear about Jesus going out by himself to go pray. So he's going out to these desolate places after he do, does, do, does these miracles, but then the crowds continue to find him. So I don't want to say that he's trying to hide from everybody, but he is trying to separate himself and is not successful in that separation. Hmm. Although he never, you know, that, I think there's something to that. You, you do see him try to, you know, get away from it all. That may be not the exact picture, but we do know, you know, he does go out to pray so that being by himself is certainly a part of it. We talked a little bit in the end of chapter one, where Jesus heals the leper, that part of part of what seems to be going on there in the healing of the leper particularly is that Jesus winds up in a desolate place while the leper who has been healed is able to move in and out among people that he wasn't able to do before. And so this, you know, you get that idea of the great exchange that's there, at least in that text. But there is this continual movement of Jesus throughout the text. All the while, though, even when he goes out, finds himself alone for a short time, it never seems to take the crowd very long to find him. He still, he teaches them. He doesn't, he doesn't send them away without doing something for them. And I think that gives us a picture of the compassion of our Lord. What do you think? No, I, I certainly agree with that because it's not like Jesus is trying to get away from it all because, you know, he hates the crowds or something like that. And he just, he can't take it anymore. So he's just going to go have some alone time, you know, time to himself. That's not really his purpose here. Uh, when the crowds do find him, even while he is alone, yes, he does something for them. You know, he will heal, he will teach, you know, he will continue to do all of these things. I think the reason why he is withdrawing in this way is partly because, you know, especially in the Gospel of Mark, you know, he tries to keep things down low. He doesn't want to be known as, well, to use the language of John, as a bread king. You know, he doesn't want to be known just for his miracles. And so he's separating himself in this way as a way of, keeping the, the, what he has come to do on track, if that makes sense. It does. I think you can see that throughout the Gospel of Mark. I think you can see it in the other Gospels as well, that Jesus, as he teaches in various places, as he does the miracles that he does, he does them with a specific purpose in mind all along. He's moving towards a goal. And Although I, I think it's Luke that phrases it this way, he hasn't yet set his face to Jerusalem, which he does right around his transfiguration. He still knows where he's going. And so as he moves throughout Israel, teaching, preaching, doing miracles, it's not random. And although it may be hard sometimes for us to pick up as we read, he's doing that. He's directing events. And I, I think you're right to see that. You know, It's not his time yet. I think that's how he speaks in the Gospel of John. His hour has not yet come. And so he doesn't want to be known as this miracle worker. We even see that, hints of that in the Gospel of Mark, as Jesus will sometimes tell people, don't say anything right now or don't say anything at all, because he's the one who's in control of how the news about him spreads. He's the one directing events, which will ultimately lead him to the cross on Good Friday. Right. Well, and I think you can also see one other aspect of this control, which he has in the fact that as he's going out to the sea, he's not doing it just kind of happenstance. I mean, yes, he's doing it to be separated, but he's also doing it because this is where he is going to meet Levi, mm. who we also call Matthew. So his purpose in doing this is both keeping the mission on track, but God also directs all things for the salvation of men. And in this case, the salvation of this tax collector sitting by the sea. That's right. He has Levi in mind when he's doing this. And I I think maybe the, the English doesn't, sometimes it, it reads maybe coincidentally as we read it in English, as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus sitting at, like, oh, he just happened to be there. Well, no, no, Jesus knew what he was doing. He knew where he was going. He knew that Levi was going to be sitting there and he went to call him. So Oh, where, where, where do you want to start, Pastor Pastor Heidi? Do you want to start with Levi, who he is, or do you want to start with tax collectors? You, you mentioned both already. <laughs> uh, maybe Levi as who he is would be the shorter part, <laughs> so we can get that, that out of the way. All right, so tell us about Levi. <laughs> we know from the other Gospels of parallel accounts in, in Matthew and in Luke uh, that this, in fact, is the 
Matthew. This is the gospel writer Matthew, who was a tax collector prior to his uh, becoming a, an apostle. So uh, Levi here, as he's also called, because it was very common in those days for people to have more than one name, kind of like how Paul was also called Saul. Um, Le- Matthew or Levi, whoever you want to call him, is doing his job here, sitting at this tax booth. Uh, by the Sea of Galilee. And so part of what Jesus is doing here is not only calling this man to faith, but also calling him to be one of his apostles. Mark is quite short about this. We don't get a lot of detail. This is fleshed out quite a bit more in Matthew and in Luke, but we have the the bare bones of what happened at, at this moment, right? That's right. Only one other note on Levi, the son of Alphaeus. And I don't know if you looked at this at all. I just did a little bit of reading and I'm not sure that you can say for sure one way or the other. In the list of the 12 apostles that Mark gives in chapter three, he does name him Matthew rather than Levi, mm-hmm. but he also lists a James, the son of Alphaeus. And mm-hmm. Alphaeus is said to be Levi's or Matthew's father as well. Maybe they were brothers. Did you look at that at all? I, I didn't find anything conclusive. I, I don't have anything conclusive on that either. I think I think it's possible because Alpheus is kind of a kind of a rarer name, so it's pretty maybe it's likely that the two were brothers. Um, but you know, the, Levi on the other hand or Matthew were very common names. So you know, this this was I think this is a case of where they probably just had two different families, both of whom had you know Alpheus as their father. That's my sure, opinion. So. Sure. Yeah. That's and, and I don't think there's any way to say for sure one way or the other. In terms of the two names, Levi would be a, a Hebrew name, Matthew, a Greek name, perhaps? Uh, I'm trying to remember. I, I think I think that's the case. Yeah, because Levi, of course, being Levite, and then Matthew being more Greek in character. Uh, that's not always the case. Sometimes you have two still very kind of uh, Hebraic names, uh, like you know that 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 can happen, but it's just in this case, I think Levi would be his more Hebraic name. Yes. Okay, so we've got Levi Matthew. Mm-hmm. He's the one sitting at the tax booth, and that's probably the bigger thing to talk about here. Right. Matthew is a tax collector. So, take us into the profession of tax collecting in the ancient world. Yeah, and it gets complicated in a hurry. <laughs> Taxes are always complicated. Um, taxes are always complicated, no matter what century we're in. So <laughs> um, Matthew, as a tax collector, is in this case working as a kind of customs officer, because in those days, you have to remember the dominant power, of course, over all of, most of the Mediterranean at that time was Rome. OK, and Rome um, in some places was directly controlling you know, certain areas. That's the certainly the case in Judea, which is south of Galilee, which is because we now have Pontius Pilate in control at that time. Um, but in other places, you have uh, more client type kingdoms like this, which is what Galilee was at the time under the reign of Herod Antipas. And, and part of what Herod did is the Romans let him be king of his own kingdom as long as he paid a tribute. Okay. So as long as he kept paying this tribute, the Romans agreed to protect him to give him military aid, but otherwise they would kind of leave him alone. So to pay for this tribute, they had these tax collectors. And in this case, Matthew was sitting by the sea, probably because he was levying a tax on the, the fish that was that were going in and out of the Sea of Galilee. And so this continual trying to farm up taxes to pay off these debts, to pay off these tributes, also to pay for the building programs around the kingdom. This was how the government got money. It was not a regular taxation, uh, the way that we think of taxation, where, you know, I got to pay my income taxes this year. It's not quite the same thing. It's more like, you know, I want to get money out of this thing so that I can pay for these other projects. Okay. So that's, that's tax farming in general. That was the idea. Now, when they sent them out to do this, they basically would say, okay, you go into this area and I want you to bring back this amount of money. Okay. It was always kind of a set figure. I'm levying this amount of taxes on this region kind of a thing. Um, but in so, in doing so, they basically left it up entirely to the tax collectors themselves. And you can only imagine what would happen in a situation like that. You know, how we, we want you to get this much money. We don't care how you do it. 
that, that would be a profession that seems ripe for corruption. Extremely. In fact, that's how they were all viewed as basically being crooks, as being thieves, uh, people who were unscrupulous. They were just out to make money any way that they could. That was the, kind of the stereotype of being a tax collector. And for for a Jew during this time, a tax collector would not have only had the reputation of being a criminal, but even, correct me if I'm wrong, an enemy of, like you're working for the enemy. You're working right. for Rome. You're not working for the people of God. That's In a Jewish situation, you almost got that double bad reputation going on. Exactly. Although I should point out here, because this is Galilee, Matthew's not working for Rome directly. Matthew is working for Herod Antipas. And Herod Antipas is, you know, ruling over his own kingdom. Now, that doesn't make it any better because they would still see him as kind of a, a, a traitor because where's this money ultimately going? To pay off Rome, right? Mm -hmm. So, but because he's in the employ of Herod Antipas, you know, farming out his taxes, and Antipas was kind of a cruel king to begin with, um, you know, because as many of the Herods were, the, the people would still view him with a lot of suspicion. But yeah, the, the, Jewish, um, the Jewish people who did this were seen as traitors in addition to being thieves. And so for that reason, as we see in the next part here uh, in verse 15, which we're not going to get to just yet, but uh, they're, they're classed together as tax collectors and sinners. They're kind of a, a, low, a low end of society, the kind of people you wouldn't trust any further than you could throw. All right, so Jesus is going to someone with a a bad reputation. And, you know, this isn't too far off from what we've seen from Jesus so far. I suppose the the fact that he goes the he goes and touches the leper back at the end of chapter one, we've seen Jesus push some boundaries, if we can say it that way. And so for him to go to a tax collector isn't entirely out of his MO. And yet it still probably should surprise us that Jesus approaches Levi, the son of Alphaeus, at the tax booth. He's actually doing this. He's on the job when Jesus comes to him. And, and this is this is a surprise, or at least it, it should be surprising. We'll talk more about that when we get to the scribes and, and the Pharisees. But for the time being, when you look at what Jesus does, I mean, it almost seems too simple to be true, Pastor Heidi. He, sa- he goes to Matthew, he says, follow me, and he rose and followed him. Mm-hmm. And that's that. Is that really all there is to it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's what Mark tells us, right? I mean, so Jesus comes to Matthew, like you say, while he's on the job, and he calls him. And it is something, I mean, th- th- this call is such that Matthew not only decides that he's going to follow after Jesus, he decides in that moment to basically you know, get, turn in his, his resignation right then and there and say, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to follow after Jesus. Mm-hmm. And I, I think, I mean, yeah, we, we might call it simplistic. We might call it, you know, kind of a, a rosy view of things. But, you know, sometimes it is just that simple. You know, when God calls us to himself, you know, we, we just go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think sometimes we make it, we, we always try to, to make it sound like it's the, the, always going to be this arduous, difficult thing, but what God can do what he wants to do. And in this case, when he calls to Matthew and says, follow me, Matthew does not hesitate. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, God can do what he wants to do. That That's a good point to make just generally when it comes to Jesus calling his disciples. We saw in Mark chapter one, where Jesus used the same words, follow me to those fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. Here he uses the words, follow me to the tax collector by the Sea of Galilee. Very simply, Jesus is the one who takes the initiative. This is not, and again, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I I believe that the general way of a disciple becoming a disciple at this time would have been the disciple would have picked the teacher under normal circumstances. Jesus reverses that. Is that true? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And so Jesus... He takes the initiative. He is the one who calls the disciple. And part of the reason, you know, I, I, I talk about, is it really that simple? I read, read a couple of commentaries and, and, you know, just here and there. And, and some of them suggest, well, maybe Matthew had heard Jesus previously, or they'd had some interactions previously. For example, we know that some of Jesus' disciples were disciples of John and they'd heard Jesus and maybe interacted with him before he called them to follow him or something like that. 
I don't know that you ever hear that about Matthew. And as I was reading those, I was like, you know, I'm not sure that that we need to understand that. It may just be that simple that Matthew, Levi, meets Jesus for the first time. He hears that authoritative word of Jesus, and that word has the effect, and and Matthew follows him. It really, the the calling of Matthew, I think, really highlights the authority of Jesus and his initiative in calling the disciples and causing it to happen. Absolutely. And this while you were talking there, I was thinking about uh, the stories of some of the martyrs because, yeah, I mean, yeah, we always think of it in terms of this difficulty. Well, he heard it somewhere else. So he was kind of, you know, the, the pump was primed there. And that's the reason why Matthew just gets up and goes. But you think of some of the stories of these martyrs, which come down from us to us from history, where they talk about, you know, someone who is being martyred. And because of the way that they conduct themselves while they are being martyred, they're persecutors, their tormentors will sometimes convert then and there and be martyred right along with them. You know, there's no, there's no build up to it. There's no, you know, pr- priming the pump here. They see the witness of that martyr and, and the faith, which they are, uh, which they are proclaiming in their death. And they immediately say, you know, I want to, to die for Christ as well. And so I think we, again, we don't want to make conversion always to be this arduous, difficult thing, as if it was something that we have to wrestle with for years and years and years, and then we'll finally come to it. When God wants to call us to faith, we will come. <laughs> if, if that takes 20 years or if that takes 20 seconds, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I mean, for those of us who then are proclaiming the word of God, a text like this ought to bring us some comfort simply to proclaim it. And and that's not to, you know, that's not to say that there, that there's not a place for something like apologetics and longer explanations and, you know, clearing out some of those barricades that might be there. Sometimes that is very necessary, but it is the word that does the converting. It is the gospel by which the Holy Spirit calls the sinner to Himself, and you know, we. I think a text like this frees us and gives us some boldness simply to go out and proclaim who Jesus is, what he's done for you, and let the word do the work and just kind of get out of the way. Again, not to say that that explanations have no place by no means. I mean that you know we need to do that. But sometimes just preach the word. Just just say Jesus died for you and and let the word do the work. Absolutely. Yeah. Just call on them to, you know, to call on Christ and to follow him and then <laughs> maybe just leave it at that. <laughs> if right. you, know well, I, you know what I mean? <laughs> sure. Yeah. And, and to, and to trust the word is going to do the work, you know I mean? And, and, and let it do it, let the word do the work and, and stay out of the way. I, yeah. I mean, it, it's, Jesus says, follow me. And Matthew follows now, now having, having said that, just those two words in English, follow me. It's very short. Matthew literally gets up and, you know, starts walking behind Jesus. What does that entail for Matthew to follow Jesus? I think this is one of those phrases we talk about as Christians, you know, you follow Jesus. Well, what does that actually mean, Pastor Heidi? Well, for for Matthew in particular, I mean, if you want to, in the most literal basic sense, like you say, he's going to literally follow him. It's also going to mean leaving behind his livelihood. It's also going to mean that he's going to learn from him. He's basically entering into Jesus's school for, you know, for several years. Um, It's also going to mean that he's going to follow Jesus to his death because Matthew, like most of the apostles, was martyred in the end. But um, for us, I think we could understand that in, in a very similar way, not, not in the sense of, you know, we have to leave everything and, and go to seminary or something like that. That's not what this means. But that to follow after Christ is a, it's a life changing thing. It is something that is, I mean, you, you can't, you can't start and, and look back like, like Jesus says, you know, whoever sets his hand to the plow to follow after Jesus means that we are entering into something completely new and to be like him in everything, whatever that may mean, <laughs> suffering or, or good or good. Right. Right. So, and I think you may have started to, to go that way, but just to, to go there specifically, when Matthew was called to follow Jesus, there were certain things that, like you said, I mean, he very literally walked with Jesus. 
when we talk about Christians today following Jesus, where's the what's the overlap with an apostle who followed Jesus, quite literally, and a Christian today who follows Jesus? Does well, that I, make sense? Yeah. No, I, I, I think the, the most basic overlap would be the, the word itself, right? That Matthew is hearing the word uh, from Jesus and he is, you know, learning these so that he would also write the gospel. But we as Christians, as we are following after Jesus, are also hearing that same word uh, through Matthew in this case, or Mark or Luke or John, or, you know, whoever is proclaiming that word. And for that reason, we are hearing his voice and we are following after him to do what to do his will, to, to carry out what he wants us to do, and also to be saved. Yeah, and, and I appreciate the way that you said it with Matthew, too, that to follow Jesus involves a going through death into resurrection, just as our Lord went into death and was raised. So we, too, go into death and resurrection. It's happened for us in baptism. It'll be made full on the last day when he raises us from the dead. So follow him. That's what we're doing here on Sharper Iron. We're going to take a short break, but we will be right back. Please stick around. Since 1978, Lutheran Church Extension Fund has had the humble privilege of supporting Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and her workers. Thanks to faithful investors, LCEF has provided thousands of church workers, congregations, schools, and organizations with the low-cost loans and resources they need to reach more people with the saving name of Christ. To learn more, visit lcef.org or call 800-843-5233, 800-843-5233. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Wednesday, January 20th. We're looking at Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. We've got Pastor Zelwyn Heidi with us. He serves at St. Peter Lutheran Church in Hanover, North Dakota, Zion Lutheran Church in New Salem, North Dakota. He's also one of the hosts of the podcast, A Word Fitly Spoken. Pastor Heidi, prior to the break, we were talking about the calling of Matthew, the calling of Levi. Jesus says, follow me. Matthew does. The word has the effect. The word does what Jesus says. From there, this scene has taken place by the Sea of Galilee. From there, Jesus goes to Matthew's house and there's a there's a party. There's a feast is the, the scene that we go to. The, the way the text reads is that he reclined at table. So, that's not the way we talk about eating. What does it mean to recline at table? We see this elsewhere in the scriptures. Sure. In Jesus's time, uh, tables, especially in the Roman fashion, were often shaped like a upside down U or an N or however you want to picture it. So you had, you know, the main table and you also had two tables coming down from it. And when people gathered around these tables, they didn't have chairs in the way that we have chairs. They had basically couches, the way that the kind of couches you sometimes see uh, where they only have one arm. So that the idea is, is you're supposed to lay on them and you're supposed to sit, you know, kind of basically in a, in a lying position. So you're reclining and that's how they would eat. And where you sat at this table, of course, had social um implications, but that's not really the point here. Well, not a little bit, but not as much as it is in other other passages. But yeah, so Jesus then is basically eating in this kind of Roman fashion, which was kind of very common in those days, where he would sit on this reclining couch as he's as they ate at the table. Hmm. Yeah, the, the places at the table are not specified here, as they are in some places in the in the Gospels. I think it's in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus talks about the place you sit at the table and how to choose that and how that applies to the kingdom of God. Right Here, though, the fact is Jesus is at the table with other people. So what, what, is the, what does that mean to eat with someone? What's the significance of that? I, I mean, I think we still have some of that today. In Jesus' day particularly, what's the significance of eating with someone? Well, I think you, you kind of hint at it that we still have some notion of this, you know, that when we eat a meal together today, we usually do so because we have a connection with each other in some way. 
you know, usually because of family, you know, we talk about eating uh, dinner together as a family at the at the, the table. We, you know, if we have a, a potluck at church, we do so because, you know, we are gathered together as the church. And so we, we are at the same table with one another. It is this idea of being in fellowship with each other, this connection which we have with one another. And I suppose you could say in, in some basic sense, an acceptance of one another. Um, but in Jesus's time, of course, in a in a culture which is very, very careful about who you associate with and the kind of the rules of hospitality to eat at the same table with someone is a very big deal. Uh, this is something which is basically saying I'm associating with this group of people uh, that this is I'm, you know, even to the point of saying, like, I identify with this group of people. Um, which is why the Pharisees and the the kind of the richer people, you know, refuse to eat with these kinds of with the people that Jesus is eating with, because it would kind of lower them in their social standing. So for Jesus to do this, to actually actively associate with tax collectors and sinners, says something about what it is that he has come to do. So Jesus is said to eat then with tax collectors and sinners. We've talked about the tax collectors and the reputation they carried. Sinners is a much broader term. What does it mean that Jesus is eating with sinners? Who are these sinners? I mean, everybody's a sinner, right, Pastor Heidi? So (laughs) what's being communicated in the word as Mark records it, that Jesus is eating with sinners? The, the basic idea is that he's associating with these kinds of people that are not as scrupulous in their observing the law as other people, especially the Pharisees. The Pharisees are seen as, as being very particular in their observance of the law. They're very careful about what they're trying to do. Those who are far less careful or who are maybe a little bit more lax about their observance would be these sinners. So it's not just the the very grossest of sinners, you know, like the the, the tax collectors or the the prostitutes or you know whoever fill in the blank. You can put whatever you want there, but it's also those who are just not at the same level of quote holiness, the same level of righteousness as these other groups. And so for for them, for the the Pharisees, who will, I'm sure we're going to talk about a little bit more detail here in just a moment, uh, for them to associate with these people would basically mean a corresponding, you know, break in their own holiness. You can't you can't associate with the the lax without becoming a little lax yourself. Hmm. So sinners in the way that the scribes and the Pharisees would have defined them is is how Mark uses it it seems here. Not just sinners like what Jesus is inviting everybody, but the type of people you normally wouldn't associate with in polite society that's who he's got at the table with him. Is that kind of the force that we're looking at? Yeah, I think so. All right. So with that in place, then that's the scene. Jesus is feasting with tax collectors who have a really bad reputation. He's feasting with all of Matthew's friends who are of a similar bad reputation. They've come to eat there with Jesus and looking on Mark tells us, are the scribes of the Pharisees. Now, we've, we've met the scribes previously. They were in the text before in the healing of the paralytic, and they've questioned Jesus already. This is the first time we meet the Pharisees, though. Uh, help us with, you can give us a review of the scribes, but particularly help us with the Pharisees, Pastor Heidi. How much detail do you want? <laughs> well, yeah, we've got about 20 minutes, so give us give us a, a good a good summary of who the Pharisees okay. were. So the, the Pharisees and, of course, their associated group, uh, the Sadducees, are important movements because after, well, let's see, the, the time period between the Old Testament and the New Testament was a time of great turmoil for the Jews. Okay, this is when the, you know, the monarchy has come to an end, the kingdom is being overrun, they're being ruled by foreign peoples, and then you, you have the whole issue with uh, with. Uh, with all the kings who were basically trying to put an end to their worship. And so during this period of religious turmoil, a couple of the groups that come out of this turmoil as a way of trying to find you know, faithfulness, as a way of trying to find stability, are the Pharisees and the Sadducees both. Now, I know we're not talking about the Sadducees, but they're related. Okay, And the way that the Pharisees find this stability, the way that they basically prove themselves faithful, is in their careful observance of the law. 
They figure we're not going to be like all of these foreigners who have tried to make us, you know, apostatize and offered up all of these um, bad sacrifices. We are going to be as careful as we can in observing the law of God. Now, what really sets the Pharisees apart is that they not, they not only try to observe the written law of God, they also try to observe what they what they would basically be an unwritten law. They believe that Moses not only wrote down what God told him, but God told him some other things too. And it was this tradition, this unwritten tradition that governed their conduct. So they were, they were so zealous for the law, they're not only trying to keep what was written, they're also trying to keep what wasn't written. So they're basically taking it up another notch, right? And it was because of their this idea that they were observing the law so zealously that they were even keeping the things that weren't written down that made them view themselves as basically being, you know, sticklers for the law, as being very righteous kind of holy people. And that ended up causing them to look down on these other groups as well. Hmm. I think uh, as Christians reading the Gospels, we see the Pharisees or we hear that name and we think those are the bad guys in the hmm. story. And I mean, that's true. And we can talk about that. But among the Jewish population of the day, the Pharisees probably would have been held in pretty high esteem. Look how hard those guys are trying. They're trying to do the right thing. Don't you think they would have been mm -hmm. probably pretty well respected? Very much so. Yeah, no, these these were very well respected members of the community. Uh, they were re religious religious authorities because of what you know their of how zealous they were for the law. No, they they would have been looked upon very very favorably. And I think the only reason why Jesus, you know, speaks against them is not because of, you know, what we might associate with being a Pharisee, but simply because they <clears throat> upheld their unwritten traditions over what was actually written down. So much, in fact, that they actually broke the law of God in an attempt to keep these so-called traditions. And it is that for which Jesus condemns them. Hmm. Right. And, and the fact, I mean, the fact that one, the Pharisees would have been viewed highly among the general Jewish population, makes Jesus' opposition from them and toward them all the more striking. That, that's one thing to notice. And I think, you, I think you're right that, you know, it's not, it's not like it's bad to be zealous for the law of God or to be zealous more broadly for the word of God. These are good things, but the Pharisees take it too far. And I think too, and I know this is just the first time we've met them in Mark's gospel. We'll see it more. They, the Pharisees don't see how the word of God points to Jesus. And I think, right. I think that bears out in this text as well. And, and perhaps that's why Jesus is so hard on them at times is because of all people, they should have seen how the word of God pointed to Jesus. They knew what the word of God said. Yes, they they went beyond it and they should not have, but they knew what the word said. They should have seen how it pointed to Jesus and they missed it. And and perhaps that's one of the reasons why Jesus, well, maybe a couple things. One of the reasons why he, he seems so harsh against them, he is so harsh against them, and two, why he talks to them so much. <laughs> uh, if anybody should have gotten it, it should have been them. And, and that's the tragedy is that they didn't. So these, those are the, the Pharisees. Anything else there with the Pharisees, the scribes, uh, or any response, Pastor Heidi? Well, I think, I think it's worth pointing out here that uh, in, the, in the Sermon on the Mount, I know this is Matthew and not Mark, but when Jesus says that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven, it does show that the problem of the Pharisees is not their righteousness in this sense. It is because they, even Jesus in that case, I think holds them up in very high regard for what they are trying to do. But it is, as you say, the fact that they miss the point of all of this and also because they uphold their unwritten traditions over what is actually written in the word of God. So it is, it is these men, the scribes of the Pharisees, who observe the scene Jesus is eating with the tax collectors, with those who are not attempting to follow the law of God or these unwritten commands to the standards that the Pharisees have. And so they they look with derision upon Jesus. I mean, just take us into this objection, Pastor Heidi. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? What's, what's their problem? 
Well, as, as we kind of hinted at before, the, the problem with the, the Pharisees that they see here and the scribes in particular, <clears throat> who are closely associated with them, is that by associating with these people, you are e- effectively tarnishing your own righteousness, your own holiness. You can't associate with the, in their minds again, you can't associate with, with sinners, you can't associate with tax collectors without drawing yourself into, you know, some extreme suspicion. Like, if, if, you, if this is the kind of company you keep, what does that say about you? I mean, we, we, do, we have that to some degree as well, not to the same that they do, of course, but we, we understand that impulse a little bit that, you know, you, you're running with the wrong crowd, you know, you have bad friends, whatever the case may be. It's, they, they would see it as being, you know, a, a ritual defilement of their own holiness. And so for Jesus to associate with these people, he's, they're basically, they, they don't understand it because he's, they're basically saying, well, what does that say about him? What does that say about his reputation? What does that say about his own holiness? What about his own righteousness, right? Well, and, and beyond that too, what does that say about his teaching? If if they're calling sure. into question Jesus' own character and righteousness and holiness, he's the one who's been teaching. Mark's been emphasizing that. What does that, what does that say? I mean, all of this in their minds, it's like one of these things doesn't go together in their minds. Jesus has, has shown himself to be a teacher. He's shown himself to be one who works miracles. And now here he is associating with the people that in their minds he shouldn't be associating with, the people that he should be telling, you need to repent. It, it, it doesn't look like he's doing that. And so, it, I mean, there's this dissonance in their minds. They just can't put all these pieces together. If this is the, the type of people that Jesus is willing to sit down and eat a meal with, what does that say about him? What does that say about his teaching? Does it fit into what we are trying to accomplish? And again, as you said, you know, we're coming out of the context of, of the exile and coming out of that and all of the, the turmoil that would have been experienced by the Jewish people in the intertestamental period. They're trying really hard to hold on to what's good. They've gone beyond it, as we've said, but they're trying really hard. And, and here they see Jesus and it looks like he's going to mess it all up. Again, not to say that the Pharisees and the scribes are right, but just to try to get a feel for why they get eventually just more and more upset at Jesus to the point that they're ready to kill him. That's what we're starting to see here already. Absolutely. And maybe maybe this would be helpful as a way of kind of getting into their mindset. You know, we know, for example, that uh, blood is, is a forbidden thing to be eaten in the Old Testament, right? Well, even in the New Testament, that's one of the things they talk about in Acts, Okay. In their minds, they are associating that kind of defilement, that kind of ritual uncleanness with associating with these people. So it's as if Jesus was eating blood right in front of them. That's the kind of dissonance that they, they're experiencing. They really don't understand why Jesus is doing this. Because doesn't God say, don't do this, and yet here you are doing it. Now, the reason why this is a problem and the reason why Jesus speaks against them is because they have made this kind of an association. They have gone beyond what God actually said. And it is their own unwritten traditions that they are trying to uphold here. And so their own scandal that is is happening right in front of them, as if Jesus was eating blood in their eyes, is that their their own unwritten traditions are causing them to stumble. And Jesus is basically saying, no, you've missed the point entirely. (laughs) Your own made up laws have have blinded you to the fact that this is what you should have been doing all along. And so we get a taste of that already in Jesus response in verse 17. In response to their question, Jesus says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Here we have that word sinners again. We've got the word righteous as an opposite to it. Jesus paints it. It's not a parable per se, but he does use picture language. He, he paints a picture for us of physician, sick, well, all these things. There's plenty to unpack here. It, what is what is Jesus talking about, Pastor Heidi? Let's start digging in. Okay. So, I mean, the idea of, you know, those who are well have no need of a physician. They don't need to go to the doctor. They're not sick. 
those who actually are sick are the ones who need to be saved, right? So he's talking about the redemption which he is coming to bring. Now, Jesus says, I have not come to call those who have no need of salvation, which the Pharisees in their own eyes think that, you know, think that that of themselves. I have come to call those who understand their need for the, the physician. I have come to call those who understand that they, in fact, need to be saved. The, 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 the going beyond the law that the Pharisees did led them into a, a works righteousness, that they believed that it was because of their own observances, because of their zeal, that God was, in fact, showing them favor. They saw themselves as righteous. But Jesus says, no, I have come to call those who recognize that they do, in fact, need a savior. So uh, just to kind of point out what Jesus isn't saying, when he says, I came not to call the righteous, Mm -hmm. well, I mean, that doesn't mean he came only for some people, right? Or, or, and it doesn't mean that there are some people who are righteous apart from him either, correct? Right, right. Yeah, no, this is, this is not Jesus saying that there is a category of people who exist in the world that we would, that is righteous, that don't actually need Christ's blood. That's not what he's saying here. He really is, this is his very colorful way of preaching against this attitude of the Pharisees and with their own views about holiness coming from their unwritten laws, which have caused them to despise their brother, which have caused them to despise their neighbor. They see themselves as righteous in that sense. And Jesus says, I've come not to call you to, to the, the healing, I, I mean, understand me when, I, when I'm saying this here, but those who actually recognize their own need for their, their own sin, their own brokenness, their own sickness, as it were. You know, you have to understand that you are, in fact, blind, as Jesus will say in, in John chapter 8, before, and before you can be actually made to see again. But as long as you say, I see, your blindness remains. Yeah, so I mean, in, in in one sense, then, Jesus is explaining to the Pharisees why what he is doing is appropriate. He is eating, and I think, you know, even, even from the Pharisees' perspective, this should make sense. He came so that, you know, the people who are sinful would receive salvation. That, that makes sense. The image that Jesus gives makes sense that that's what he would do. He would go to those who need his help, and that's who he's eating with. So Pharisees, scribes, what I'm doing is right because these are the very people who need my help. They're the ones who are sinful. I came to save them. So it on the one hand, it's a justification, a true justification of what Jesus is doing. I think at the same time, it also serves as a rebuke and a call to the scribes and the Pharisees themselves. In, in other words, it, I mean, you can tell me what you think. I think Jesus intends for them to recognize in his words that they are actually not among the righteous. They are among the sinners and come to him in that way. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I mean, because in the moment that Jesus justifies himself and says that what I'm doing is right, that what I'm in fact doing is a godly thing, that I am not actually going against the law as you think that I am. I'm only going against your mad main traditions because what I am doing is right and you are not doing this, that is that kind of implicit condemnation. It is a proclamation of the law in that sense to the Pharisees. They need to repent of their lovelessness, they need to repent of this attitude stemming from their, you know, extra laws and come back to the truth so that they themselves would see their need for the physician. Right. And and in that way, Jesus is calling them to himself. And I think, you know, we, we see the conflict that Jesus has with the Pharisees and the scribes throughout the Gospels. And it might be easy to look at that as some sort of antagonism, but actually there is a great love for Jesus as he does these things. He is, he is calling these men to himself. He's calling them out of the religious system that they've created for themselves that has gone far beyond what God actually gave. And he's calling them to see the fulfillment of the truth in himself. He, he wants them 
to join the party. He wants them to sit down at the table with him and with these others. Right now, the the stumbling block that's there for them is these other people. And Jesus is saying, no, it's not a stumbling block. Come and sit down, join the meal, come to me, count yourself as a sinner with them. And when you do, here's the Savior. Jesus says, that's me. That's who I am for you. Yeah. And I, the only thing that I would add to that is that uh, the offer of this, you know, come to me, this call to them eventually is going to come to a head and they will, in fact, receive judgment because of their continued opposition. So we, we do want to take the call to come to Jesus, to follow him, to come and to eat at the table with a kind of urgency to it. And because Ultimately, the the day of grace will come to an end, right? I mean, God is not going to be re- rejected forever. I mean, we, we see that in the fact that the Jews uh, are have suffered a rejection finally when you know because they crucified the Lord of Glory. But at this moment, that has not yet happened. This is just the beginning of the conflict, and so there is a genuine call. You know, turn away from your sin. You know, do not harden your hearts as you know your fathers once did. Come to me and be saved. Yeah, that urgency, as we were saying at the very beginning of the show, that urgency builds pretty quickly here in the Gospel of Mark. You're going to see Jesus' language get strong really quickly. I mean, just a, a couple texts into the into this chapter, you're going to hear Jesus say, "Haven't you ever read?" Haven't you ever read what happened? I mean, you're going to see the the language escalate, the urgency grow and grow as Jesus continues to desire these men to turn away from their hardness of heart and repent and see themselves as the sinners who are in need of the Savior, and that's who Jesus is for them. Pastor Heidi, we got just about a minute and a half here left. Help us wrap things up. Point us to, to Christ crucified and risen from this text. The, the call that we hear to Matthew to follow after him is one that, you know, that Jesus gives to all of us today. And it is the same call which he has given to the tax collectors and the sinners. It's the same call which he even gives to the Pharisees to, to leave behind the works of darkness, to leave behind, you know, our former way of life and to follow after him because he is the one who will ultimately give us life. He is our great physician, the one who will, in fact, deliver us from all our afflictions of body and soul. And so, I mean, I would I would just, you know, close with that that same exhortation, you know, follow after him, come to him and call on his name and be saved. Pastor Zelwyn Heidi is the pastor at St. Peter Lutheran Church in Hanover, North Dakota, and Zion Lutheran Church in New Salem, North Dakota. He's also one of the hosts of the podcast, A Word Fitly Spoken. Pastor Heidi, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you. Jesus calls his disciples to follow him, and his word is effective. It is effective for sinners, for you and for me. We are those who are in need of salvation, and the Savior, Jesus Christ, has come for us. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.